So today we're going to talk about planning and registering your online workshops. We know that there are several things that um, have may have changed, several things that we've been adding, and so this is going to be a nice little one-stop shop to get you prepared if you have not taught an online workshop or just some things to follow up on if you have. So you're thinking about an online workshop, where do you even begin? So the first thing is I would like to direct you to review our online resources um, in the Carpentry's Handbook. And I have a screenshot here. Um, I will make my slides available as well. Um, but in this online resources, we have everything that has come to us. So whether it is information that the core carpentry's team we have found to be um, good information, um, or if it's information that someone from the community has shared with us, we have put this in the online resources. It's updated regularly. So definitely encourage you to go here as your one-stop shop um, for anything related to online workshops. Um, in addition to that, we have the recommendations for um, online workshops. This particular form, this is more so where you have your guidelines. So this is really our guidelines for how to run a carpentry workshop online. So this would, I, I would say, starting with your resources for online workshops is your first step and any and everything that you need to know um, would be in this particular area. So you've read our information. You said, okay, I think I might be able to do this. Okay, now what? So we need you to let us know. So notify us. There are, um, we do have a workshop request form. So this workshop request form is where you let us know that you're interested in having a workshop. So in this form, you can either inquire about a workshop um, and that's, you just want to talk to someone and find out about, you know, how do I even start, you know, how do I even start um, preparing for an online workshop? Um, if you want to request a workshop, and requesting a workshop is what we call a centrally organized workshop. This is where we will recruit instructors and I'll uh, provide more information a little bit later. Um, and then also registering a self-organized workshop. So either way it goes, if you are planning on having a workshop, this is your first step to notifying us and letting us know that you would like to have a carpentry branded workshop. So I'll start with self-organized workshops. So with self-organized online workshops, um, the first thing is I'd like for everyone to consider reviewing our FAQ page. This is a brand new page that we recently launched and it has information about um, basic, all general things about workshops. So whether you are doing an online workshop, an in-person workshop, um, if it talks from the audience of the workshop organizer or if you're an instructor. So again, this is a um, area for you to go to and start there. You know, if you're thinking about a self-organized workshop, you can also start here. With self-organized workshops, it has not changed as it related to in-person workshops. We, um, you're still responsible for uh, all of the logistics. So the only things that we will help you with, or I wouldn't say the only things, but once you fill out that workshop request form or you notify us of that workshop, um, it's in our queue to make sure that the workshop gets put on our website in addition to making sure that we get you your, um, we get you your survey result links. Now, what's really important that we ask that has, um, that is crucial when organizing your online workshop, we know that each workshop has a particular identifier um, and that's the workshop ID. Um, we ask that when you create your workshop website, you use the naming convention that's listed, listed on the screen. So that is the year, the month, the date, the site name, and, um, and to ind indicate that this is online. This will help us on the back end. Um, we have several different places where we have to update information for workshops and to make sure that everything runs smoothly. If you let us know that it's online, that just helps us um, make sure that we get you all the information that you need. For centrally organized workshops, again, there's a section in the frequently asked uh, questions page for centrally or organized workshops. 
as it relates to in person as well as online. But there are a couple things that happen with the centrally organized workshops. Once you complete the workshop request form, um, the carpentries we provide instructors, and I'm speaking now specifically for online workshops, we will um, provide two experience instructors and up to two supporting instructors. I am going to explain supporting instructors momentarily. Um, we will provide registration. Um, if you have your own registration um, uh, program, we use Eventbrite. If you don't want to use Eventbrite, you don't have to, but we do provide this as an option for you. Um, and then Zoom room if necessary. Now I state if necessary because it is our recommendation that if the workshop organizer, if they have a, a video conferencing platform that they use their platform. And that's mainly because um, this platform will be something that the learners are familiar with already. So that will kind of uh, mitigate some of the learning curve of having to learn a new video conferencing uh, platform. However, if you do not have access to a um, video conferencing platform for the dates that's requested for your workshop, um, we do have Zoom rooms available for you. So I mentioned a supporting instructor. We want to talk about this. We did add this to um, our workshop workflow recently uh, for online workshops. We've received a lot of feedback and people stated, you know what, one, it takes a lot of work for um, two instructors to do it to um, teach a workshop. But also we realized that we are still training instructors. Um, however, our instructors are being trained to teach in-person workshops and they don't have the experience or they may not feel comfortable with teaching an online workshop. So in order to provide experience for instructors to build confidence, also just to you know, see how it's run, um, we are providing the opportunity for instructors to sign up as supporting instructors. And a supporting instructor is an, a certified carpentry instructor who has taught three, um, who has taught less than three workshops. So you'll see often in our um, documentation that it'll that we state that you know um, experienced instructors will teach. Experienced instructors are anyone, any certified instructors who has taught at least three workshops since being certified as an instructor. And so a supporting instructor is an instructor who is certified and has taught less than three times. This is particularly important for centrally organized workshops. Um, because with centrally organized workshops, the workshop organizer is requesting that we, we um, provide instructors for them. This is a little bit different than a helper as well and twofold. One, for centrally organized workshops, we do not recruit helpers and we don't want to, um, we don't want to start changing what we do. Um, and so it makes it easier, one, so that the, the, the host is still responsible for recruiting helpers. However, this is a great way for our instructors to gain experience. Um, and as a supporting instructor, you, if you feel comfortable to teach, you can teach a section, or if you just want to be there to support um, and assist where you can, that's also an option as well. Um, and to sign up for a supporting instructor, you would sign up as you normally would as an, um, as an instructor for a workshop, and that's on our um, spreadsheet. And in our spreadsheet, we have it identified for you to be experienced, uh, to note if you're an experienced instructor or a supporting instructor. Um, additional information for, uh, regarding a supporting instructor is also listed on the FAQ page. Um, class size. So I get questions, we get questions a lot in, um, in team at asking about the class size for, for class for workshops and the recommendation um, max 20. However, we have not seen a lot of workshops that have had um, had have met 20, but our max would say 20. Just again, based on the feedback that we have received, um, the smaller the number, the better, um, just so that instructors would still be able to have that one-on-one -on -one experience. Our biggest goal with our online workshops is we are still trying to provide the the same experience as you would with an in-person um, in workshop. 
Um, and then the other thing is we get the question, does it have to be, uh, this workshop have to be taught over, you know, two days? No, it does not. Our recommendation, um, particularly with centrally organized, but this can go for any workshop, is that you spread it out um, three to five days over time. Um, we say this because one, instructors can get fatigue. Um, also, the learners can get fatigue after looking at a computer all day. And then we also have to take into consideration that a lot of our learners and instructors are, they may be at home. And so they may have other um, uh, priorities or obligations that they have to tend to. Um, so that may interfere with you getting a full experience. So our recommendation is that doing an online workshop that you still actually spread it out over time, over three to five days. And again, this is based on um, the workshop organizers and the instructors and the needs of the audience. With that, I'd like for you to help us. How can you help us? Um, we are constantly, again, I can't stress this enough, as we receive information and feedback, we are constantly updating um, our resources available to everyone for teaching an online workshop. We'd like for you to share your feedback. So um, we have a Google, um, a Google form for you to share your feedback, whether you're an instructor, a learner, a supporting instructor, a host, a helper, we would like to receive your feedback. Um, also, if you have taught a workshop, feel free to write a blog post. On the resources page, we have blog posts listed that shares the experiences of instructors and they tell great stories of what some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't work. And then lastly, we ask that you attend a discussion session. If you have taught a workshop, please make sure you share your experience with um, with new, with new instructors who are going through the checkout process, who may have questions, your experience is very helpful. Um, and that helps us to get our best practices. With that, I am complete. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Cher. That was amazing. Um, we have time for one question before we move on to Jean. And if there is no question, we uh, a question. Open. If Colin okay. has one, thank you. Has anyone actually run a workshop with more than twenty people? Because I'm running one tomorrow, I think, if everyone turns up, and I'd like to know what your experience was. From okay, we have someone that says they have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was at UCSB. We had about thirty-five people between. Um, last Friday and the Friday before. And um, I think both Christine and I could say that was probably the max that we could handle over Zoom. Um, we had a helpers? lot of helpers. We had, um, I think we probably had, a, well, not 10. We had about five helpers, but everyone each had their own jobs. We had about three people that were helping with the chat. We had one or two people taking notes in the ether pad. No, and then Tara, was, it was closer to, we had 10 helpers in the beginning and some people left a little later. Mm -hmm. And and at the beginning, I think we did need all of those helpers because um, as you can imagine, there's so many install issues um, just getting situated on Zoom. And by the second day, things were running pretty smoothly. So I, I think we needed less helpers at that point. Um, but I think that the 35, and, and tell me if you um, agree or not, Christy, there's just like, especially the first day, there's so much going on in the chat that if we had mm -hmm. more than that, I think it would have been harder to keep track of people. Yeah. Like we set our max to 40. So I think the first day we had 36 participants and then we had 30 something the second. But um, it went pretty well, but that was, uh, we, we had it pretty well organized and everyone had, all the helpers had their like, their job that they were doing and that helped a lot. Amazing. If anyone else has other questions about it, you can feel free mm -hmm. to reach out to us. Um, so Torian and Christy, uh, can people find you on the Carpentry Slack or yes. where is best yes. to find you? there. Okay. Yeah, both there. Um, and I'll put our email addresses in the chat here. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you for sharing your experience briefly and Colin for asking the question. Uh, no, he says in chat, last week we had code refinery workshop with 91 participants, including both helpers and learners. 
plus expert helpers and instructors, uh, then in total around 100 all the time. It sounds um, like it will be a really great experience to write about if um, either of you are open to it and we'd be happy to publish on our blog too. Um, yeah, we're planning on writing a reflection. Um, mm -hmm. We have another workshop starting this week, so. Amazing. Thank you. That, that will be incredible to read. So in the interest of time, we have to move on for now, but thank you for sharing. So Jean, over to you. Hello. Um, so I'm just going to show, uh, demonstrate the uh, changes that have been made to the template uh, to allow for online workshops. Um, so I'm going to share my screen uh, here for a bit. And uh, I hope everybody can see uh, this browser window uh, that I have. If, uh, if you can't, uh, please do let me know. Uh, so the workshop template, um, uh, the changes that have happened uh, mainly have happened in uh, the index.md file. So um, uh, I've taken the workshop template and I have uh, uh, created my own repository using this template. Um, uh, for today's date uh, at Mars University Online. Um, and if you look at, if you go to the workshop uh, website uh, and go to customize, uh, you can see the instructions uh, for uh, customizing con config file and customizing the home page uh, to um, specify it to what your university is. Um, and the online instructions are underneath the home page uh, section. And there are uh, these four bullet points um, to address. So I'm going to walk through this um, and also walk through the config file just to make sure that everybody is aware of the defaults uh, that are set here. And um, add, I will ask to see if anyone has any questions afterwards. Um, so uh, going to uh, my new uh, my new site, you can see that it looks exactly like um, the template site does. I need to fix a lot of things. So if I move over to my GitHub page, um, I can uh, go ahead and navigate to the config.yaml file and click on it. And then I will edit that and make sure that I have my carpentry uh, is set correctly. So if I wanted to have a software carpentry, I would set SWC data carpentry of DC and library carpentry uh, is LC. And I'm being ad advised that my screen share uh, is frozen. Oh, nobody can see a uh, the tabs that I moved. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to just share my screen here. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so let me just share my desktop. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I have, I have, I am in my uh, repository and I'm editing the config.yaml file. Um, and uh, I can, I can change the carpentry. It defaults to software carpentry. So if you're running data carpentry or library carpentry, please do change that. If you're running data carpentry, you can change the uh, fix me um, to be uh, data carpentry ecology, genomics, so on and so forth. And here I'm going to change the workshop title to uh, Mars U Workshop. And um, I'll scroll down and commit this change. And I will. Uh, I'll be able to see that uh, it changed on my website. Um, well, it will eventually. Uh, so I've committed that and I can go now to the index.md file. And uh, this is where the online workshops uh, will, uh, will take place. So uh, the venue, um, you still you still will put uh, the venue of your of your host institution, but the address. If you're using if you're using a workshop, um, if you have a private link, you want to put online. Um, 
And if you have a public link, you want to put the link uh, with the URL. Um, so you want to uh, put HTTP, uh, HTTP um, and whatever your URL is. And then the country is this is whatever your host institution is. Um, langu uh, language is the same. Uh, and everything everything else will be will be the same. Uh, what you definitely need to change is uh, the address uh, here that indicates where it's going to be. So I'm going to scroll down and commit this, these changes. And also, please do let me know if you would like me to slow down. Um, so I've moved over to my display website. Um, and currently, it's, uh, uh, it's still building. So I have to refresh it a couple of times uh, for this to work. And um, actually, I'm not sure why this is not refreshing. It should be uh, working. So I am um, <laughs> I'm not sure why it's not working. But uh, let me go ahead and remove this comment, see if it works. This is the problem with um, doing things live. Uh, you have, it's like math on a blackboard. So I deleted the, uh, the block that you're supposed to delete. And let's see if that worked. Okay. So uh, you can see that online, um, uh, it says that the, the link is online and then there's a link to, um, uh, the link that I put in there. If you just specify online, it, the link, this link won't appear. Um, but those are the most important aspects of this, um, of uh, configuring your website. Um, and again, uh, make sure that your, your um, venue is the same as the, uh, uh, your venue is the same and your uh, country, uh, indicator is the same. What you need to change is the address uh, indicator. So um, with that, I can uh, take any questions um, and clarify anything. So uh, thank you. Thank you, John, and for being brave enough to live demo. <laughs> um, any questions? I have to toggle um, screen. There's, there's many of us on the call, which is great. Um, so you can unmute yourself to ask in case I don't see you in time. Okay, oh, okay. Phil has a question. Yeah, that was great, Xiang. Um, just thinking about if there's a Zoom session, and sorry, if there's a Zoom session and there's a password element as well, is it, is that Going, thinking it's a bit too far to say that password will be delivered some other way, some other kind of note that goes with the online part. Is that necessary? Um, as far as as far as passwords go, that's going to be um, uh, there is what I forgot to show you uh, that so uh, that is provided by the instructor, and that's actually um, I'm going to share my screen again. If you you're on this website, you, if you scroll down, um, it, it indicates that the instructor should be sharing the password through some other means uh, with the participants. Um, so that helps. Okay, um, thumbs up from Phil. Thank you, Phil. And any other questions before we move on? It doesn't look like it. So, Manisha, over to you. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so, Cher talked to you like an overview of um, what we're doing as we shift to online workshops. Jian talked to you about <coughs> excuse me, setting up your workshop website. Um, and I'm going to do a, a presentation on how we use Zoom, because that's what we use for all of our online workshops and trainings. Uh, just like the call that we're on now. So this will be kind of a meta presentation. 
um, for events that um, we, as in the Carpentries, are hosting ourselves, like uh, community calls, instructor training events, uh, we provide a Zoom link for you. Um, if you are running a centrally organized workshop, as Cher talked about, uh, meaning that you've paid for the individual workshop or for a membership um, and we run it for you, uh, we do recommend that you use your own institution's uh, video conferencing platform, but uh, because that lets you have direct control of everything. Um, but if you do think you need our setup, then please contact us uh, so that we can help you. Um, I am working on three different screens right now, so you may see my gaze or focus shifting a bit. Just know I am still always with you. Um, but I'm going to take a few minutes to update you all on the features of using Zoom, both as participants, um, as um, being on a call like this, and as the host of a call, because you might be hosting a uh, community discussion session, you might be hosting um, a workshop, and so we want you to be prepared for that. Um, when you host, when you join a Zoom call as a participant, uh, you can join either by computer or by phone. Um, and because most of our events are participatory, we do recommend joining by uh, computer since joining by phone um, limits the level of interactivity and how much you can see um, and such. Um, and so we recommend that as much as possible. And so what I'm going to do now is focus on what we do with the online interface and specifically from the Zoom app. Um, you can join Zoom calls from a browser, um, and, but you might lose some of the functionality of the call, so it's not recommended. Um, we recommend that you use the um, app. And we are also assuming that you are using the most up-to-date version of Zoom. Uh, over the past couple of months, um, while the pandemic has forced everybody uh, online, uh, Zoom is getting used much more than it did before, and they've been rolling out updates fast, sometimes um, every few days. Um, so I'm going to begin by putting a link in the chat to uh, the Zoom documentation that the Carpentries has put together. Um, and this includes uh, much of what I'll be reviewing today and begins with a link to make sure that you are on the most recent version of uh, Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to begin by sharing a few things we can all do as participants, and then I'm going to screen share so that um, you can see some of the things that a host can do. Um, so um, I am going to um, begin, um, like I said, talking you through what you just see normally when you're on a call, um, like you do now. Um, there are three panels in uh, the Zoom interface, uh, and depending on how you set up your screen, they may or may not be connected in one window. Um, but this includes the main view, um, where you can see the participants. Uh, you can switch between speaker view and gallery view. Um, there is an I there's a um, little icon in the top right corner. Um, you will see the participant view, which is a list of all of the participants on the call, um, and then the chat view, which I see a lot of you have been um, using. Um, so in the participants view, there are options to give nonverbal feedback. And you should see under the list of participant names um, a few options that you can share, including things like yes and no, thumbs um, going slower, going faster, uh, things like that. And a host can use that as a way to get feedback from the group. Um, I'm going to start doing, I'm going to use it um, as a little icebreaker. Um, and if you all take a look at the yes, no option, um, I'm going to ask you, do you know how to play a musical instrument? And you can each use the yes, no options there. Okay, so there's a mix. I don't know myself. It's something I wish I had learned. Um, but it's a nice tool that you can use, like I said, as uh, maybe a quick icebreaker, or if you really do want to get feedback from the group. Uh, much in the same way that we use red and green sticky notes um, in our in-person uh, workshops. Um, once, uh, as a host, once um, all of those responses are there, the host sees them, um, everyone in the room sees them. 
So it is something to remember that these are public uh, responses. Um, and the host, um, when I um, do the screen share as a host, you'll see this. Um, but next to all of those options of yes, no, go slower, go faster, et cetera, I also have this option that says clear all. So I can do that and all of the responses um, are now cleared. Um, hosts cannot clear individual responses, um, but they can uh, clear everybody's. Um, so I am gonna start screen sharing now so that you can see what I see as a host and I'll walk you through um, what I can do. Um, and uh, when you screen share in Zoom, you'll have the option to share either um, your entire desktop um, or specific windows within your desktop. Uh, and for now, I am going to start off sharing my desktop because I want you to be able to see um, everything that I have open. Uh, there is an option that, actually I'm going to screen share first and then I'll show you this. Okay, so you should see now a, um, I have the Carpentries website open, I have a terminal window open, um, and uh, you'll actually see also across the top um, a bunch of menu options that looked similar to what was on the bottom bar of when we were, uh, you know, in the non screen sharing call. Uh, you probably didn't see that when Share and Jian were uh, screen sharing. Uh, and that's because there's an option that lets you um, make the show up. Um, it's something that I normally would not recommend uh, because uh, it can be a distraction. Um, it also um, it tends to lower the resolution of what you see. Um, so you may not see my screen um, clearly now, but um, that wouldn't ordinarily be the case. Uh, so now you can see I have a browser open um, with the Carpentries website. I have a terminal open. Uh, in the terminal window, this is where you might do the things that you would also do in a real live session of, you know, asking people, hey, can you see my font? Should I make it bigger? Should I make it brighter, etc. cetera? Um, I'm not going to um, actually get you to see this now in the interest of time since I'm not actually teaching from the terminal. Um, but this is something that you can do. Um, I can, if you look at the um, options that I have up at the top, I can start or stop my own um, audio or video feed. Um, next up, um, what I really want to share with you is this uh, security option. Um, and I know that the uh, text might not be clear on everyone's screen, uh, but I'll read through it with all of you. Uh, this is where first, as the host, you can lock the meeting or enable the meeting, enable a waiting room. Um, and this can be really useful if you're worried about Zoom bombing, uh, meaning um, unwelcome uh, guests entering your room. Um, if you're uh, hosting a teaching demo or a community discussion or you're teaching an event, we recommend not that you lock the room because that's gonna prevent anybody from joining. And so if someone accidentally gets bumped or something like that, um, they're gonna have a hard time getting back in. Um, but do recommend that you create a waiting room so that people can ask to join. Um, and then you'll get a pop-up notification where you can let them in. Um, and when we look at chat, I'll show you that you can also message the waiting room um, so that uh, you can um, send a message to the people saying, hey, I'll be with you in a minute, um, whatever you might wanna say. Um, other things that we can do in this security panel um, is we can allow participants to share a screen. Uh, you may have seen when we first started this call, um, share, ask for permission to share the screen. Um, and that again is set off by default, um, again, as a security measure against uh, Zoom bombing. Um, then you can also, um, if you want to, as a host, um, give people the, give or um, take away uh, people's ability to chat, rename themselves, um, unmute themselves. Um, the annotate, um, I'm not actually going to go into because it doesn't really work that consistently across Zoom. Um, but you can also remove a participant. So if um, we talked about the code of conduct at the beginning of this call, if there is anything you know, that you want to address, you can remove a participant from the room. Um, you can view all of the participants. And I'm going to see if this, yes, so this works now. 
um, you can see the list of everyone there. When I asked the questions, you saw people's yes, no responses. Um, and you can also see right now that Sarah is listed as my co-host. And having a co-host is super helpful because they can help mute people, manage the waiting room, manage the recording, uh, things like that, help you out as needed. Um, the one thing that they can't do is to create or manage uh, breakout rooms. And we'll talk about that in uh, just a moment. Um, but if you um, want, you can then, as a host, assign um, a host status to someone else. So if I wanted to make Angelique the host, I can click on Angelique's name and I can um, do all of these things like making her the host, making her the co-host, um, uh, if I need to remove someone, um, anything like that, you can do that. The host can do that from this uh, participant view. Um, I can um, click on new share, which lets me reinitialize that screen share window. Um, so it's like, oops, I shared the wrong window or I shared my desktop when I meant to share just one section. Um, this will let you do all of that. Um, you can pause screen sharing. I'm gonna click on that. And right now in my own desktop, I am going to other sections. This can be useful if like, you had something in your email that you want to show everybody, but you don't want to open your email in front of everybody. You can pause this, um, and then once you have that open, um, you'll have this uh, resume share option again, and then you will um, be able to uh, continue screen sharing. Um, the annotate option lets you do things um, like basically turning your screen into a whiteboard. In my experience, it's a little bit finicky, and so I'm actually not going to spend too much time um, showing you exactly how um, that works. Um, and then there is a bunch of other options that you have as a host. Um, you can go back into the chat window, so I can make the chat window come back up. Uh, you can uh, create breakout rooms, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, pause recording, uh, stop recording. Um, if um, it's a call like this, it's being recorded. Um, meeting info. This is useful if people do need to um, get the information to um, call in or uh, need to know what the meeting ID is. Um, the annotation information, like I said, I'm not going to get into. Um, and then the audio settings and video settings let you um, switch up your own audio and video settings. Um, this is not about the uh, call or the other participants on the call. Um, and then lastly is end meeting. And I'm actually going to click on this just because I want to show you what happens if you are a host and you click on end meeting. Uh, you'll see that I have the option to end meeting for all. I'm not going to do that now because that would kick everybody out and stop everything. Um, I can leave meeting or I can cancel. Um, if I was to leave the meeting, I would have to assign a new host. So you can see here, um, I have the option, I choose a new host, I assign them, and then I leave. Um, you can't, the host can't just leave a meeting. Um, so I'm going to cancel out of that. And the last thing that I want to show you is um, how we set up uh, breakout rooms. Um, so I'm going to go back into the breakout room section and you can see that there are two ways that we can set up uh, breakout rooms. We can either do it um, automatically or manually. So I can say assign these 37 participants into say six rooms, which gives us um, six to seven participants per room. If I created rooms right now, all of you would automatically get sent into whatever room you're um, randomly assigned to. Um, my preference and recommendation is to do this manually, even if I want the rooms to be, um, even if I want the rooms to be randomly assigned. Um, one reason is that, let's say that, you know, it's mostly random, but maybe there's two people that you really want together or don't want together. Like if you were running a community discussion session and there happened to be a few core team members on the call, you might want to make sure that we are all spread out rather than have the chance of us all being together in the same room. Um, so if I was to do it manually, um, I'm going to show you what this looks like. I'll say uh, that I still want to keep that six to seven participants per room. 
So um, you can start off saying six rooms if you, as you start to create them, you realize that, oh wait, I actually wanted say seven or eight rooms. I can click on add a room here. And then for each of the rooms, I can go into assign. And you can see what happens is um, a list of all of the names come up and I will sort of randomly click on six names uh, to get us to uh, where we want to be. Um, so I'll do that for one room. I'll do it for another room. Uh, I'm just sort of random. I'm going to do this now, send you into a room just so you see what it looks like. Um, I'm not going to worry about exactly who's in each room for now because we are just uh, doing this as an example. Uh, but I want to sh um, show you how you can see that people go into the rooms. Um, I'll send you a message and then I'll um, just invite you back, um, back from the rooms. Um, and then I will take any questions. Um, one other thing actually um, that I did say is before I send you all into your rooms um, is that I did create those extra couple of rooms. And you can see that the list of people that I can assign to a room gets smaller each time as people are assigned. Um, and then there's a couple of extra rooms. Um, and I like having this also because when, once you create the rooms, you can still move people from one room to another. And having these extra empty rooms um, lets you have that little bit of a cushion to say, okay, these three people actually need to be in a different room. It makes it very easy to just move them into one of the empty rooms. Uh, you cannot easily add rooms from what I've seen once the rooms have been created. So I am going to open all the rooms. This might make screen sharing stop. I've never actually started a room, just started rooms while I'm screen sharing. Um, but um, I'm gonna send you off to your rooms. You'll see what it looks like in there. And then I'm just gonna bring you back and we can wrap up and take questions. So you should all be getting an invitation to join um, a random room. I think almost everyone is back in the main room now. Um, and I'm looking at the chat. I'm going to give it so that everyone will be back in five seconds. So let's mm -hmm. make sure everyone's back in the room. Yep. And okay. Um, so I see a message in the chat about like, um, if you want to use this as um, uh, to help um, so that learners can help um, individuals. And I think that's a great way to give people a little aside um, where you can send just them into um, a breakout room. Um, and I see a couple of you have said that you saw the chat clear. And yes, I didn't uh, mention that, but it is something that we know in our documentation is that the Zoom chat is not persistent. Um, f uh, when you like go into breakout rooms, come back into the main room, or if you had to hop off the call and had to hop back on, um, the Zoom chat does not necessarily persist. It does so kind of inconsistently. And Toby has a question. Uh, thanks, Manisha. So I have found making lots of breakout rooms manually to be quite time consuming. Um, and I wonder if, is it possible if you make them automatically to then reassign people? Like you hover over the name and it says you can move them or switch them with another person in another room. Um, if you're making two rooms or something, then doing it manually won't take very long. If you're, right. if you're trying to make 10, um, I wonder if it would be quicker to yeah. make the 10 automatically and then reassign the one or two people that you know you need to split up for whatever reason. My experience has been that it's been kind of inconsistent when you do it with the automatic rooms. Um, like it will sometimes, it won't sometimes. And then if you want to, uh, you know, add an extra room, um, you can't do that with the automatic. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's not that you have to do it exactly this way. This is, we just want to offer some recommendations. 
And are there other questions in the chat? I see Phil. Yeah. So yeah, Phil I'm asks. Trying un, I'm trying to unmute then unsuccessfully. Uh, oh no, you can see my question in the chat. But I can't yes. Um, so you're asking about putting um, people into pairs versus uh, large groups. Um, for that, I think it's very much dependent on what you're using the breakout rooms for. Uh, you know, is it for pair based activities? Is it for small group activities? Um, I, I think that is probably more a question about what the breakouts are for, um, as opposed to like the zoom technology question. And could it depend on how many helpers you have then as well? Because Colin's saying yeah. that one helper per room is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Manisha. I know we have one more question that's not been answered yet from David um, about an alternative to using chat as the place to ask questions because it doesn't seem very efficient. Uh, we can follow up on that conversation, I think in Slack, if that's possible, we are almost out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining this call and especially Cher and Manisha and John for sharing. Um, so what will happen after this call? This recording will be made available on the Carpentries YouTube channel in a few days. We will also, um, all the links that have been shared here, we will reach out to you on email and share the links with you in case you need to follow up. There'll be conversations going on in Slack general in the Carpentries Slack after this, um, mainly people sharing experiences from having many people in an online workshop and how that went. So I encourage you to join our Slack in case um, you're not in there yet. Um, and here's the link for you to join our Slack. Um, for everyone who joined us um, as part of your checkout process on your way to becoming a Carpentries instructor, um, I will be sharing your names with the checkout team here at the Carpentries and so there's nothing else for you to do in this regard and we wish you well uh, with the rest of your checkout process. Thank you everyone, um, it was really great to see you. Have a good morning, afternoon and evening. Bye everyone. <laughs>